You're listening to Orbital in Conversation, interviews and discussion from Orbital Comics in Central London with your host, Chris Thompson. You can find us online at orbitalcomics.com, like us on Facebook, follow us on Twitter, and subscribe via iTunes. Send all your comments, suggestions, and questions to chris at orbitalcomics.com. Hello and welcome to episode 119 of Orbital in Conversation. I am Chris Thompson, and with me today is Carl, who will, for the rest of the show, be known as Charlie. Hello. Bonjour. Ça va? Comment ça va, Chris? <laughs> ça va bien? <laughs> Très bien. Yeah, I, I need to practice my French a bit more, but as you may have guessed, we are going to be talking about our experience at this year's Angoulême Festival. This was what, my second year at Angoulême, your third? That's right, yeah, my third year. But we're actually developing a bit of a history of the store being represented and, and present there. So I think Camilla has been for the last six years now. Yeah, easily, so that, easily. Yeah. yeah. I actually did go years and years ago, back in yeah. the early 90s. Uh, it's changed a lot since then. There's a lot more going on um, since I first went. But uh, last year in 2013 witnessed the uh, 2014 2014 because uh, it's at the beginning of the year you 2014 think it's... yeah of course of course it is and it is you said this earlier it's a nice way to kick off the year it's a great palate cleanser yeah. I think you said yeah yeah which is kind of very French it's cuisine related but there is that whole thing because we love comics we love what we do here at the shop but after a whole year of it and the last few months of the year are always super busy because of the number Intense. of cons and people in town yep. and Christmas. To have something like Angoulême at the end of January is exactly that palate cleanser that re-enthuses really. you for the year. Yeah, absolutely. It's a completely it's a it's a comics festival as opposed to a convention, and that's uh, you know something we're going to come back to. Um, but it's definitely the whole town gives itself over mm. to. Bon dessiné, which is French for comics. Yeah, and, and they have that great universal appreciation for comics as a whole. So you see Absolutely. things from all over. It's not just very French. It's, no. it's an international show. Big, uh, a big Asian representation mm. in, in the last few years, you know, and that's been reflected in... There's an entire marquee, which is the... Comics little, from little China. Asia, I think. Yep, they, Little Asia. Well, they're um, in the China Far East Pavilion, I think they called it. Yeah, this yeah. Um, there are, of course, comics from all over the continent, Europe, uh, French, German, Italian, Dutch. There's the American contingent as well, because yeah. there's a lot of that being translated into of French. Of course, yeah, yeah. And, um, and so this year, I mean... They Scott had, Snyder, yep. they had Brian K. Vaughan, they had... Fiona Staples... Yeah. Wes Craig, Dylan uh, Horrocks, yep, Matteo Scalera, yeah. Yeah. a whole bunch of people whose work is very known in the American market and would be a huge draw at any show. But here, yeah, they're just one of many big guests, creators. Yeah, mm. it's uh, it's 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 really it's different. There isn't the whole cult of celebrity, yeah. that exists in the UK and US cons. It's it's more. Uh, level playing field you're there as an artist as a writer as a creator exactly so you were mentioning about when we were there last year which we'd worked out 2014 and they announced the well, it's the grand prize isn't it and then the winner of that is the president for the following year yeah there's a closing festival uh, on the Sunday it runs basically from Wednesday to Sunday and mm. they kind of build it up over the first few days and then on Sunday they hand out the prizes and they have the closing ceremony at which the president for the following year is uh, announced mm. and we were there for that ceremony last year which is 2014 yes um, and it was it was quite an amusing ceremony. There's 
Cowboy Hank was there. Yeah, then. what's his name? Uh, her very, Sally. Yeah, yeah, very entertaining. Um, Durf Backdurf was Durf there. Backdurf, and yeah. he's getting his award for uh, my friend Dahmer. So, yep. Yep. Uh, and so they announced the president for 2015, Bill Watterson. <laughs> yeah. Who, of course, was not there to accept it, nor had anyone there, but they were able to get his agent on the phone. On the phone on the stage and his agent was sort of very politely but vigilantly suggesting that Bill would be very honoured to be the president but he ain't going to be there yeah, <laughs> yeah. which is which was like, and very entertaining because of course Bill hasn't appeared yeah. for to, you know to over 20 years he's you know that's he not what he wants to do work speak yeah, for itself work speak for itself you know and that's cool. Yeah, so this year's festival, he was the president, which I guess was just more an honorary title. It's a yeah, but a figurehead thing. The the, the previous year, the uh, president was uh, French uh, Dutch underground yeah. comics legend Willem, mm. um, who was there and very much a presence at the oh, festival. Very you know, on. he was wandering around and uh, you know. In the bar, and indeed, this Again, year. Yes, yeah, <laughs> he was, yes, uh, as it should be. Yeah. But what they did do, which was nice, was there was a great Bill Watterson uh, exhibition of Calvin and Hobbes. Yeah, one of many exhibitions this year. Mm, which was super special. Absolutely uh, comprehensive. They had really mm. cherry-picked some of the best... If, you, if you're a fan of Calvin and Hobbes, you're going to have your favorite ones i'm pretty sure one of them is going to involve the transmogrifier which is the cardboard box that yeah calvin goes into and changes into whatever he wants uh there were at least two transmogrifier strips oh in yeah there. uh and they had sections kind of showing the different themes they go through so there was the seasonal ones spring summer mm-hmm. autumn winter uh, based cartoons. Yeah, there was the ones where they would go to these incredible, sort of fantastical lands, and that was where Watterson really would incorporate elements of his influences. So there was one that was very Flash Gordon, based. Spaceman Spiff. Yeah, yeah, proper like Alex Raymond stuff, where you kind of really getting into it. it. It's a whole different style of cartooning, but it was a way that he could homage. Some of his favorites. his influences, and that was reflected in the uh, in the center of the exhibition was um, it's, it was really cleverly done because mm-hmm. there was a, there was a sort of room in the middle of the exhibition which was a screening room which had a the documentary, documentary on, loop. on on loop, and then around the outside of the uh, room was essentially a history of syndicated newspaper strips going yeah. right back to Little Nemo. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so essentially covering the late 19th and then right through the 20th century into the 21st and giving you an idea about the history of strips and even Calvin and Hobbes and its place within that pantheon. And that was on three sides of this room. Yeah. And then on the back side of it were the gold. all his, impl- yeah, his implements, his tools and things that he used with little written explanations and anecdotes from him, which were hilarious. Yeah, it was essentially his workstation, you know, it yeah. was like, and here was a pencil sharpener that his dad had gave him when he was 13, yeah. I think, and he yeah. still uses the exact same yeah. one, but he had been prepared to send that very precious eye. Absolutely. Over. Yeah. It was touching. And, yeah. you know, one, like I say, one of the many exhibitions at this year's festival. Yeah. One thing I did want to say with that one is that you'd mentioned his influences. There was one wall of the main exhibition that was actually his influences with a written sort of thing that he had done for each mm-hmm. of them that was in both French and English. So there was things, and and they had the originals for, you know, examples of these. So there was a Walt Kelly Pogo strip. There was a Schultz Peanuts. There Mm -hmm. was an Alex Raymond, Flash Gordon. All of these with his own write-up as to why these things were special to him and how they influenced his work. 
the other three walls were just spread with Calvin and Hobbes. And it was a massive room. Like, yeah. obviously, he's the president. Absolutely. He gets the treatment. Yeah, it was. It was, it was great. You know, a, a, a really nice exhibition. And, you know, the three or four panel newspaper strip style really actually lends itself to being a great exhibit because yes. you can focus in on one and then you can... They had, you know, some strips ran over probably two or three weeks yep. in, in, in the newspapers when they first came out. Um, just great to see. Yeah, really, and you would really great to see. see people in there looking at it and you'd have a mixture of kind of awe on people's faces and them really getting into it, but then you would hear laughter. spontaneous laughter. That yeah. was... Which... It's incredible. How yeah. many exhibitions do you get that at? Well, exactly. And, you know, again, a shame that uh, he wasn't there. Maybe he was there incognito. I'd really like to think that he was there just because I don't know what he looks like. Yeah, I don't think and, anyone does. You know, <laughs> that, that, would, that would have been gold. So, Bill, if you weren't there, maybe you should have been there just to hear people laughing out loud at exactly. your glorious humour. Yeah, it's it's all about the the work and it's speaking for itself. But it was it was doing that. Yeah, one of probably at least ten major exhibitions. Mm. The other one we're going to go straight to is got to be the Kirby because yes, we're both huge fans of Jack and 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 I, I would have loved to have seen what Jack would have made of Angolim. I, I don't know. Are there stories? Did he? I ever expect get there? he was there. Yeah, he was uh, definitely doing the. European convention trail back in this day uh, just going from fanzines that yeah, some yeah. of which we're going to be putting up on the web store soon um, uh, sketches that people had Jack do back in 78 at wow. a convention in Italy so I expect Jack was probably I mean this was year 42 or 43 42 it's it's essentially as old as the San Diego Comic Con, yeah, pretty much. They're a similar yeah, age within yeah. a year or two of each other. Yeah, yeah, but you know, uh, worlds apart. Uh, yeah, yeah, it's such a different experience between the two of them. Yeah, but the Kirby exhibit at Angoulême was something quite special, although we kind of have mixed feelings, I guess you could say about it. Um, yeah, absolutely. It, it was it's an interesting um, one. So, what we should addressed straight away is that there weren't actually any originals in the exhibition which was probably the biggest shame of all it was but we did hear a good uh theory as to why those weren't there uh which is that the venue that the exhibition was in is a temporary it's it's not yeah, a prefab it was a hard it's shell a, yeah um marquee. Marquee. um so the insurance didn't cover the cost of having, you know, 150 Jack Kirby originals in there, yeah. which is, is absolutely, you know, understandable. And, and considering the caliber of what was there, the variety of, of what was there. Yeah, there's a, a 16 foot dark side greeted you at the uh, opening yeah. of the exhibition. I, I, a model, I suppose. Yeah, it's, it's like a giant statue. It's like a yeah, it's, yeah. it's incredible. But as big as I would imagine, would imagine him to him, be. Yeah, yeah. In uh, in real life, exactly. And you know, you had that from the beginning, giant Jack Kirby thing. You know, there were signs around town pointing you towards this Kirby exhibition. Yeah, was, all over the place. That's yeah. a, that's another. That's a that's a good. Uh, a good point actually the the whole town gives itself over to the, this show mm -hmm. and you've essentially got like uh, Rue Hergé and uh, you yeah. know Rue yes, de that's Goscinny the that's street. actually the main street in the town they've embraced this and you know it's 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 just wonderful uh, yeah well they've got their permanent cartoon museum that's there all year round that yeah. always features highly and we'll get to what's on there shortly yeah the this Jack exhibit, though, was great because you would walk in and so it was reproductions of art, but then it was really blown up. Like yeah, really taken the high res scans mm -hmm. on to uh, possibly MDF or something. It was it was the, the, yeah. they were incredible. 
you know, and and covering his entire career from the early war stuff, yes. Captain America. Yeah, even before that, like really early obscure stuff that was kind of new to me. Then going into all the classic Stan and Jack Marvel work that people are used to, going through to when he left and went over to DC, and there was all the fourth world stuff. But then you also had fun little oddities like the In the Days of the Mob and... What's the supernatural one? Ghost World. Ghost World. Spirit World. Oh, Spirit World. There Spirit are World, yeah. Let's not confuse Ghost World and Spirit World. No, don't, don't, two, don't. Two very different ones. Yeah, it was, it was incredible. Even up to the superpowers stuff he did in the 80s, which... Not Underrated. As, yeah. <laughs> I was say, it's like, underrated. Well, not, not as it's, good, but... It's, not as, it's, it's underrated. Anyway, Jack. Full Jack Kirby exhibition. And Chris, you, I think, sort of... Heard a rumour that it's part of a wave of further shows? Yeah, well, I, I think they had some guys there from the Kirby Museum. There was Rand Hopp and a couple of the other guys, I think, mm-hmm. who, who work with them, who were there. And so they brought this over. I mean, the scans were amazing because they were still IDW artist edition level where it's full colour so you can see every little mark, even though essentially it's black and white work. But if there's a red dot or whatever on there, it's it's all there. Yep. And they are arranging, I think, to have a Kirby exhibition in the the main cartoon museum. Okay. It might be over summer, so it's not actually going to be during the festival. It's something that you would make a pilgrimage to mm-hmm. Angoulême just to see. And... To be honest, it's such a lovely town. I mean, to see it during summer would not at all be a bad thing. No, I, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a gorgeous little French town and uh, very hilly, very hilly. Mm. A lot of walking. We did, yes, we did much walking up and down hills, and <laughs> uh, you know, I feel better for it. Well, <laughs> yeah, you to get over to the Cartoon Museum, there is quite a bit of that hiking essentially involved where yeah. you will walk down a massive hill and and down a number of stairs depending on which route yeah. you take or, or if you get lost y- yeah you could go wandering over many has, hills has happened to um, me yeah yeah, yeah. every year I did get you lost. discover the next town at one point? i did try to discover the next <laughs> town although i was trying to get to the paper museum which is on the river there is literally the paper museum sort of straddles the river and um, one of the yet another exhibition there uh, this year Course, was yeah. the uh, employee employee de moi which uh, is a amazing publisher who mm. were celebrating their 15th anniversary and gave out this uh, th- there was a free anthology with uh, oh, stories God. by a uh, collection of artists who have all been published by L'Emploi du Mois um, with uh, two, three, four page strips about being 15 years old, which right. is really, really like that was free with this. Yeah. Like, I mean, the level of sort of uh, merchandise and just stuff that's available is uh it's it's different and it's from all here. Quality. Yeah, yeah, it's all really gorgeous quality. Uh, these guys in particular, um, mm. there was an, a remarkable sort of working sculpture in the middle of the exhibition, which was which had these sort of uh, like models of it was it was a three tier building, and mm. they had like models of very sort of uh, like blocky kind of Playmobil. Figures, right. and they, you know, so they had the writers and artists on one floor, and then uh. like the printer on the other floor, and it was a, it was a working sort of toy that they yeah, made. Yeah. It was it was absolutely like remarkable. A, what, are, what are they? Is it a diorama? Was it, it was more than a diorama. It was like it was it was literally like a, a miniaturized, idealized version of their building where they mm. produce these incredible comics, and they had like right down the, to the detail of like a one inch version of one of their comics was being printed nice. and popping out of the printer into oh, wow. a little box. It was just so beautiful. And uh, that's in the paper museum, which is the bridge between 
it, it it's actually on the river. Yes. And so the paper museum, the the mill. I, I guess they would have met, had a paper yeah, mill. Yeah, yeah. Back the, in the day, they did all the pulp. The, yeah, that's that's actually uh, powered by the river, mm. which the Charente, I think, is the river. Yes, that's it. And yeah. um, so, and, and you can actually tour the paper museum. While the you're paper there museum as well is incredible. As yeah, the, yeah. The the exhibition that yeah. they had on there. It's really remarkable, and that leads through to the um, museum. Yeah. The, Musée de Bande Dessinée, which is like the literally an all year round comic museum. Mm. This year, I suppose the two big shows in there were the Moomin Show, yes, which Toby I a huge fan. Toby mm-hmm. Anson's Moomins, uh, an incredible exhibition. It, it was. They really know how to put on an exhibition. Yeah, absolutely. You know, I mean, we do some great exhibitions here. Like I'm looking around at the moment, and. Last night we had the launch of the Beast Wagon exhibition, and that Ooh. looks incredible. <laughs> yeah, lots of animal monkey sounds, sounds and, and various animal sounds. But the level of detail that's gone into this one and our new gallery system that's gone up, it's a great way to start the year. And yeah. it, it is the next level up. We've, we've yeah. leveled up with, I, with putting these on. I, I have, you know, hands down totally been inspired by the cartoon museum in yes uh at, at Angoulême and the creation of an environment bringing people further in to the thing and the the Moomin show was really uh a great example of this because they yeah. had not just original artwork they had uh you know floor to ceiling uh scenarios from yes. the comics and uh merchandise going back mm-hmm. to like really weird 70s uh seven inch singles and yeah. uh like a, a, a t- just a ton of stuff there's uh there is an actual official moomin museum in finland right which i have visited and they th- this was sort of as good as the real um the the actual Toby Anson's museum like you know the where the moon and stuff rests yeah. it's like it 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 was amazing and that was just one of the exhibitions in the cartoon museum yeah well the the other one that i guess was really huge and had taken up because normally when you go there's a couple of exhibitions there and then there's also what is the regular sort of uh year round year round uh, all the, the comics, the general all, room, yeah, 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 and 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 it's it's, it's got like a, a amazing sort of mural all the way around it, which yes. goes from everything from Kirby to uh, that goes from essentially ghost world to spirit world, and yeah, to yeah, yeah, all, all, all the around, around the world, yeah, <laughs> yeah. There, there's you know, original oh, original Peter Bag artwork. There's it's d- original little Nemo. Yeah. Uh, That's pages. worth visiting. Yeah. Any time of the year. Exactly. So, you know, if they're doing a Kirby exhibition over summer as well, brilliant. But the main part of the museum had been given over this year to uh, Charlie Hebdo. Charlie Hebdo. Uh, yeah. We, what, yeah I, I suppose we, we have to talk about it, really, because it was... I was really hoping it wouldn't cast a shadow mm. over the exhibition, because the remarkable and shocking events that happened in Paris... Um, literally weeks before yeah. Angoulême, um, directly related to comics. It was, it was, I think it was two weeks before. Yeah. So it was literally, they had to put this exhibition together very quickly, yeah. but they were able to assemble a whole selection of issues of the, Charlie from throughout the years. The entire really, history, yeah. really, was, was on display there, right up to the latest issue, mm-hmm. uh, which was really it was it was quite shocking and touching and moving there were like i mean i saw people crying in oh, there yeah. just you know looking at the, the you know they had video with interviews with the creators you know guys literally like Carbu weeks and these, yeah was yeah, it and... yeah 
and in fact they had a side room which was kind of dedicated to those guys mm -hmm. and with examples of their particular art up and, and things like that yeah. it, it was amazing but then on the flip side you did also have just outside of where the exhibition was going on the the guys who were representing charlie there who yeah. were actually selling subscriptions it's like you know jump on board this magazine Let's... well yeah that's uh you know and, it's and, but all very good natured it, none of it was mercenary and none of it was horribly mournful it was um respectful yeah. but it was a, a resilient kind yeah of thing. definitely definitely um you know i mean I, as soon as we got there as we left the train station and walked again another walk uphill prepare yourself for that yeah, um, let me do a lot of walking yeah uh, it's good for you uh, every single shop had Je suis Charlie in the window yes and we were just like okay this is this is it and then when we got to uh, the town hall which is where you register to get your passes and what forth there there was you know a, a either side of the town hall had a list of all the people who had been killed mm. um on you know big banners either side and it was just and then in the middle they had the the giant banner of fauve the yeah, character the, the cat yes. with who holding a sign saying je suis Charlie yeah. and you know it was inevitable to be unable to escape it and not recognize it but as i had feared it did not sort of cast a shadow it wasn't no it wasn't all encompassing no not at all and it, in fact you know we'd referenced it earlier talking about the president of the show from last year who was willem yep and willem was actually a contributor to charlie and has been for like 40 Decades? years, yeah. yeah. It's uh, the history of Charlie... Uh, we did investigate the history of mm. Charlie Hebdo, and it's really rooted in comics. It's rooted in the undergrounds. Um, we picked up a number of copies of early editions of Charlie, when it was Charlie Mensuel, which was... It was a monthly, mm -hmm. and it was essentially an anthology which reprinted... Uh, Newspaper strips. Yeah. So you've got Peanuts, you've got Little Sky Abner. Sky Pirates as well. Uh, Sky Pirates. Uh, and then, you know, Crazy they'd Cat. throw in... Yeah. yeah, Crazy Cat. And then they, oh, they, they'd good. throw in, you know, there'd be pages of Crumb. There'd be pages of Shelton and uh, fre their French contemporaries like Pichard and, you know, and, and Willem mm. had cartoons in there. And so... The magazine, as it exists now, uh, sort of really did generally come out of the underground, um, which was good to see, you know? Yeah, well, was that, like... that was like one of the cool things, because last year I hadn't been aware of Willem beforehand, and we went, and at the opening ceremony he did this wonderfully surreal and strange live drawing on stage, uh, much like what they do at the yeah. Lakes Festival. You can sure. tell that the Lakes is kind of mirroring themselves and, and trying to follow the example of yeah. Angoulême, both Good. in terms and, of you know, inclusion of the to town them. and yeah. and doing these live drawing yeah, sessions. It's, it's it's a wonderful you know it's it's, it's a wonderful sort of inclusive way of of doing a festival. Mm. You know, celebrating yeah. comics. And so seeing Willem do that and then we went and saw his exhibition. It's quite graphic, wasn't it? It's was like yeah. I mean that that is one It was put full on political commentary yeah, being it's, writ large and live. Yeah, right there in your face. Uh -huh. And uh, you know, that is something that exists within French culture. It's it's there's a different sense of humour, there's a co more coarse in one way, but mm. like actually quite blunt and truthful yeah. in another way so you know take that as you will some people took it too far <laughs> but uh, but we then you know so we'd, we'd seen his exhibition all this stuff he was there as this looming large figure then this year we were sitting in the great Havana bar there which is oh yeah always a favorite and we kind of look up and there strolls by Willem just just on his own just very casual last year's president and here he is, just stopping in at the bar for a pint. Absolutely. As you do. Yeah. And uh, salut, Willem. 
indeed. I think Willem actually quite sort of heavily involved in editing the, uh, the issue, issue the, the, the seven million print run issue yeah. of Charlie Hebdo, which well, that was seven followed. million when we were there, yeah. and it was I think on its fifth printing. So yeah. now it's yeah. got to be yeah. you know closer to ten or something. Yeah, I think the 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 actual follow up to that issue has just come out so those guys have taken six weeks right off and they probably need it but uh, yeah one of the many exhibitions yeah um, well one of the ones that I didn't get to and that was on the way over there was the Taniguchi one Jiro Taniguchi that was a remarkable um, exhibition that was a it was in yet another big space. It was like the Plasmobius, I think it's called. And it's obviously, you know, named for Jean Jarreau. Mm-hmm. And uh, who did he did some work with? He did work with, yeah, he did a remarkable book called Icaro, which is the legend of Icarus, which they did a, they riffed on a version of the Icarus story. Mm. Uh, in Incredibly beautiful. And, you know, I mean, his line work clearly, you know, up there. You know, they it, yeah. it just worked really well. Uh, complete sort of four or five room exhibition mm. with, uh, you know, um, <laughs> there was a Zen garden in the middle, <laughs> in the middle of it, which was, wow. you know, you know, of course people had put their hands in it, despite signs saying "Don't put your hand in the <laughs> Zen garden." Um, really. Uh, career retrospective and you know I I am familiar with some of his work and was you know really enlightened and you know definitely going to pick up uh, more of this sort of manga master I I just he's uh, definitely a a cut above and uh, there was uh, you know over 300 pages yeah, in there of uh, all kinds of stories and really sort of slice of life stuff. You know, there's there's stories just about food. Uh, there's, right. You know, it's 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 great stuff. There, there was just such cues the time I tried for that one that I, I was just like, oh, I'm, yeah. I'm not going yeah. to to get in. I, I mean, there is so much to see there, and as you there is. probably picking up. It's over a, a broad area, so you need to kind of have a bit of a plan. It's over when the you're it's over the whole town, and it's, yeah. you know it's not a big town, but you you do spend it's time big enough because you're on foot. Yeah, yeah, and obviously with you know recent events, security had been stepped up, so actually getting into the shows was a lot of it was just being uh, screened and scanned. Yeah. Uh, that. You know, hopefully that won't be the case next year. So one thing we didn't mention at the museum was the now what what was it called? The wonderful three D immersive oh, yeah. extravaganza. Yeah, uh, the secrets of Le Rubin Monde, and that was a remarkable yeah. exhibition within what felt like a like a planetarium, like almost a planetarium. mini, yeah, with a three D. Projections, yeah, but it was a three hundred and sixty degree, three hundred and sixty degree three yeah. D projections, which was interactive. So you know, without giving too much away, essentially the planet comes under attack at one point, and there's asteroids coming down at you, mm-hmm. and you can actually Swap. smack the asteroids, and they explode, and it was re- remarkable. Yeah, I've I've never seen anything so interactive with that the 3d was just amazing even if you just stood there and watched it it was Mm -hmm. a spectacle but the fact that you could genuinely interact with it and impact upon the story of what you know what was happening engage with the narrative was just very very cool i haven't seen that anywhere else said the closest thing to what i imagine a psychedelic experience is like (laughs) yeah 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 did you get to any other exhibitions at all? I was just trying to think whether there was any others that we actually got to see. Or yeah, uh, I know at one point, like they had a kinky and cozy retrospective that we didn't yeah, manage to see. That was in the in, sort of in in the church hall, but uh, you know, I guess really the um, 
the the main retail areas mm-hmm. are kind of like an exhibition the whole time anyway it's That's uh, true. you know specifically the nouvelle monde which is basically where the independent publishers mm. uh gather and it's probably about three quarters of a kilometer long yeah it's a, it's a big long uh marquee pavilion just outside the town hall it's, it's like a full two pavilions out one it's two it? yeah it's it's, it's, it's definitely they're joined two. together and there's a little stairway segment between yeah um and you know in there are all of the sort of indie publishers mm. from all over the world yeah really there's like we you know we've met some some of our uh compatriots inside yeah. inside yeah and uh, well that that was one of the cool things like you know if you're at a show here often if there is something that might be the equivalent of the indie tent it's probably going to be called the indie tent but here it's the nouveau monde the, the new the, world the new world literally so there's already a different level of respect i guess yeah. going on and just acceptance and this is this is the future because yeah. you know like some of the time that is exactly what happens and so yeah it, it was kind of cool because you, know, you would go through the the front first tent and that was usually some of the bigger independent publishers and the more established ones yeah so and as you go you towards know, the back there's your newer guys yeah it's like the, the you know the, the the bigger would be the uh you know uh guys who've got the rights to republish the, some fantagraphics and uh, yes. you know drawn and quarterly kind of uh, and material. also reprinting some classic french bidet yeah which there, there's a bit of that going on yeah. as well some interesting things yeah definitely i um, i should just mention actually if people are hearing interesting little sounds in the background whether it be of food or of uh, you know liquid sloshing around we're actually enjoying a french picnic in the spirit of angoulême while we record so we have mm. some little french toasts with cheese yeah we have some nice french red wine uh e- even some french sparkling water yeah and i recommend you do that at home as well kids it's like while you listen yeah yeah yeah, yeah. it's so when we were there we were able to as Carl said catch up with some compatriots and people we know who were in the Nouveau Monde there is the I guess, would you say ubiquitous the, the ever present Sean has a party Sean has a party and Les Destinateurs yes uh, yeah absolutely and, and so yeah he is always there with his group and they have a space towards the back of the Nouveau Monde yeah. and you know, it's it's always this kind of guessing game as to whether Sean is going to be the first English person that you see at Angoulême. It's generally either going to be him or Paul Gravet. Yeah. I think it was Paul this year. I don't remember. It was Both lovely was people. The first night. Yeah. Hi, guys, if you're listening. <laughs> Paul will be listening because actually later on in the show, uh, I will be running a little interview that he and I did after Angoulême talking about his feelings in regard to you know his history with the show and when mm-hmm. he first went as well cool. as how he felt about this year's Excellent. Yeah, he's he's always great to talk to about these things yeah absolutely so the nouvelle monde was you know like i mean that's the it's it's, it's one of the three main retail areas yeah the le monde, le monde des boules is the kind of mainstream so you've got the, the the big French and European publishers Dago and Casterman Glenna. and Glenna. Um even uh, Urban Comics who are the ones that do all the reprints of the American stuff yeah. for one thing like they were the guys that had Snyder and Vaughan and Staples yeah. and all of them over yeah. they were also the guys that we saw who had been reprinting, doing really nice editions of the Fourth World stuff that was in the Kirby exhibition. Absolutely. Um, gorgeous, so, gorgeous editions. Yeah, uh, so shout out to the Urban Comics guys as well. Yeah. Uh, yeah, Carl, you've got the flyer there well, for Glen- yeah, Glenart. Glenart is like uh, picked up on the Image mm-hmm. Comics stuff big time. And, the, you know, the, the, there's again 
lovely additions forthcoming. Yeah, well, and of good friends of the shop as well. Yeah. Like you've got Drifter and Ivan Brandon was there mm-hmm. at the show and he just signed with us last year after Thor Bubble. Yep. And they've got Sex Criminals and I guess we can sort of say it here as a bit of a exclusive advance notice but we will have Chip Zadarsky here signing in April. Looking forward to that. Yeah. Uh, Emma Rios on Pretty Deadly. Yeah. There's... You know, they have a great appreciation for just good comics. It doesn't Absolutely. have to be French. They, they've yeah. got the global perspective but it's got to be good. Yeah. it's uh, <laughs> That's their qualification. Yeah. It's got to be good and it's, it's, it's very interesting to see we've got... Uh, you know our own comic culture here, which is superhero based. Yeah, it's it's you know it's based on the American model, and uh, that simply doesn't exist over there. It's it's a small part of something mm. from another country over there, and that's really refreshing. Yeah, you know, and again back to your uh, sort of palate cleansing reference. Mm-hmm. You know, it's it's like. It's a, it's really refreshing just to get away from that and because uh, I love it, but it's you know it's 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 lovely to have a completely different take and a completely different yeah. angle on comics, and the yet, ninth art. Yeah, you know. Yet it's still there. Like you know, I know later in the show we'll get to talking about some of our personal swag, mm-hmm. things we picked up and things we noticed at the show. But one thing, while we were talking about Le Nouveau Monde, just down from where uh, Les Dessinateurs were all set up, Mm -hmm. there was a few French guys, and they had a comic they were launching there called Capitan Anarchy. Mm -hmm. And it was a superhero. Hey. And they, they were selling their first issue there. I think it was about five or six euros. And so that also interests me, because I know... They're not as steeped in this superhero culture. And so to see the French take on it, to see how different countries approach and tackle this stuff yeah. is, is always interesting to me. So I, I had to buy one because it's of course. interesting. And, and it looked beautiful. And of course, they have this wonderful tradition there. You know, they do signings, but they're... What was it? Dedicace? De Dedicace, yeah. Yeah, where they... It's, it's just a whole different experience. You, it's just like... It really is. You you have this personal one-on-one moment with them, but they will not just sign your book, they'll sign it to you, and, and, you know, they'd love to personalize it to you, and then do you a little sketch inside. And when I say a little sketch, these are actually quite detailed, detailed, beautiful things. This isn't a little, you know, head sketch and next. It's very... You you have a moment. Yeah. Uh, And, uh, like, these guys did that for me and really put in the effort but that was something that you know we would have experienced with several people absolutely it's it's um it's not as kind of treadmill mm-hmm. as conventions can be here and again it's a festival so you know there's yeah. a there's a different <clears throat> dynamic between the creators and their fans it's you know it's yeah it's it's uh it's very pleasant yeah so the Le Monde de Boule, there's actually two of those uh, giant marquees mm-hmm. because there's so much of that. But then the other uh, great marquee is the is it Espace Parabéde. Espace Parabéde, yeah. And that's like, I mean, that's, that's a lot of fun for me and, and yeah. well, both of us. Yeah. Uh, basically, it's the old comic section. And so. It's not old comics, it's old uh, vintage bidet and merchandise and prints and it's the retailer's hall, basically. Yeah, it's the dealer room. The dealer <laughs> room, yeah. The dealer room. And um, yeah, I picked up some gold there. Mm. Again, some of which we're going to be offering for sale. Yeah, well, through the, the boutique web store, which is going to be finally forth, coming. coming. Yeah, yeah, it's forthcoming. And actually has some great stuff yeah. on there uh, unique Blake and Mortimer mugs oh yeah they were incredible those gorgeous things that they, like yeah things you wouldn't believe kids um, 
these are like beautiful tea sets essentially yeah, yeah, and stuff. yeah. but, yeah, yeah, but were... it's like with the yellow M and Blake and Mortimer mm. and Horus and what forth um, we picked up some great stuff yeah which will you know we might even feature it in a little section of an of a future show I, I think that we might do this this could be a little little soft pilot yeah <laughs> Yeah, I, I know that in that tent they had a, a few places where, I guess a bit like what we have where they're offering cheap comics and things like that, you know, all these comics are, you know, two pound each or whatever, yeah. they would have sections where it was, you know, all the beta volumes were five euros each. Yeah. And I didn't want to do it at first, but I just decided to get in there and, and muck in with the rest and literally just be one of those guys who perused all of it because there was no order, there was no sense. But if you looked, there was some really nice stuff. There, there was gold gorgeous. to be had in there. And at five euros a piece, it's yeah. stuff that... You know, yeah, because when, when when we say Bay Day, what we're talking about is the sort of uh, large sort of... Uh, Hard, hardback, hardback. O- oversized, oversized hardback, which is the standard format for French mm. comics. Yeah. For Bon Dessiné, that is the standard format. It's like uh, the size of a a large oversized hardback here. Um, They're about sixty to one hundred and twenty pages, yeah. varying. Yeah, and uh, you know, to be able to pick these stuff up for you know. Mm five each or, or or like five for twenty five for twenty euro and yeah, stuff like yeah, that. Yeah, they do deals like, on bulk amounts. Yeah. It's uh it and it's there's so much there which is yeah. just no longer completely alien to me, but you know, like a lot of it I I, I already know. There's Mobius stuff, there's blueberry stuff, there's mm-hmm. um, you know, obviously Asterix, Tintin, like early editions. And this stuff of course has a resale value like some early Tintin editions oh, yeah, go yeah. for more and you know it's it's, first it's very interesting first printings of course yeah, yeah yeah like here yeah it's 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 very interesting to see it's just in a different size with a hardback it's lovely of, of course because essentially the French just want to say that you know we can take what you do but we can do it and make it look even better yeah, exactly, and well, the, you, you know, it's 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 just uh, something more ingrained in the culture. There, it's it it's already literature. It's mm. it, it's not weird to be sitting on the tube reading a comic. Yeah, or the metro, reading a comic. It's normal. It's 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 funny. There is that slight. Uh, Gap. We were at the train station at Paris. We were in what is probably the equivalent of W. H. Smith's. Yes. And yeah. you know, there was stacks of Scott Snyder's Batman, but in a really, really nice edition. Really like, nice. Yeah. You know, the Court of Owl stuff. You kind of go, Just, DC. Why can't you do that? Oh yeah. What did, you know? You're jipping us here. Um, and then you know, it's and, all and then next to it, yeah all this other stuff and then you'll have your latest edition of you know Charlie alongside the daily newspaper Black Sad yeah and there's no distinction or separation of things being a lesser form or you know a specialist shop this is like this is the norm this is standard yeah and that's cool yeah now it it was great and in the uh, Espas Parabede there was now, I can't remember their company name, and this is killing me, but uh, there was a couple of guys who You can put staying. it in the show notes. Yeah, I, I will do. But um, well, I guess first we should explain, when you're staying in Angoulême, there's hotels there. Uh, you, you know, and they have a, a few because it's a festival town. They do have jazz festivals. They have various, you know, sort of conventions and events throughout the year. So yeah. apparently it's yeah, quite yeah. a vibrant place to live, but it has the benefit of still being a smaller town. Uh-huh. But they have all this stuff on. Uh, however, if you're going to Angoulême, essentially the hotels are all block blocked by the big publishers who are bringing over their talent. So you're not going to get in there. In order to find somewhere to stay, you need to find someone to stay with. Yeah. Uh, and... Ben- B and B, 
Bed yeah. and breakfast. Es- essentially, yeah. Yeah, but, but you're actually staying <coughs> in a family home, so they will kind of clear a room for you or let you use one of their children's rooms or, or whatever for the time you're there. Kick the kids out for the weekend. Yeah, yeah. It's like you, you all go and stay together at this person's place and we're going to rent out your rooms pretty much. Yeah. And, yeah, so we were fortunate enough, or, or Camilla was back in the day, to have some contacts that she was able to get in and find a place and then on the year I was going we needed somewhere for me to stay and so we uh, they spoke to their neighbors about having someone stay for the first time and that's what I did last year and we got on wonderfully you know we spent the final evening I was there uh, speaking wonderfully in kind of broken French and broken English having a great conversation over wine and both of them started to flow quite naturally after a while of course and that is the communication. Yeah, it's uh, the, the the elixir of um, life and uh, communication. But it, it was great. And so going back this year, they had some extra people staying there that okay. enjoyed the experience. Yeah. And so a couple of the guys staying there were actually doing their own... Um, I, I guess it would, would be the French equivalent of artist edition books... And so they were reproducing classic uh, bande dessinée from okay. the original art. Mm-hmm. And so you would have all this great kind of black and white line work that had been reproduced in full colour. So you could see every little detail and nuance and Wonderful. what have you. But then they would also commission new art for this edition. And so you would have kind of posters and fold outs and things all in this giant over oversized format wow like original art size mm-hmm. and so they would have very famous french artists who contributed their interpretation of this character or series and what have you and it would come with like a tip in plate and wow. signed and i think they were doing editions of sort of 2 to 300 okay so these books they they were not cheap but mm-hmm. were Incredible. Well, our just editions aren't cheap. Exactly. They're, yeah, they, they were essentially the same price, but more limited, and mm-hmm. there, there was certainly an even more boutique aspect to these. And and these guys were firefighters in their regular life. That was their okay. day job, and they were doing this publishing on the side. Wow! And uh, it, it was their kind of first year there, so they were set up in the Espace Parabé Day, yeah, yeah. and staying with us as well and they had brought over a French artist who lives in the same area as them uh, Jean-Yves Mitton okay and I wasn't familiar with him okay but he was introduced to me as the French Kirby wow because he was talking about the Kirby exhibition saying have you seen it yeah yeah. you know he's a guy in his 70s early 70s Uh, okay Brilliant with his English, which is great because I keep promising to practice my French. Sure, and, you just know, do it. Need to, yeah. Uh, as the the joke became Lani Pochin, which is yeah. uh, next, next year. year. Yep, yeah. and, and so it was always next year and, and Future. uh, futures. <laughs> exactly, and uh, but anyway, so he was also staying at the place, but I, I kept missing him because he was always out. You of know, course, he was yeah, great. So, so the popular pub, pub, and pub. yes, yeah. <laughs> Uh, but he was there with the guys, and he, so he was telling me about the Kirby exhibit, and we were chatting about that, and they said, oh, well, this this is the French Kirby. And of course he said, you know, nobody is Kirby. Kirby is Kirby. Yeah. Like, you know, I, I can't course. touch the hem yeah. of his garment kind yeah. of thing. So but, how, how is this guy the French Kirby? Well, he worked on a book called Strange. Okay. Or what we would say is strange, but strange. Sure. And... It's essentially like here in the UK, you've got the Marvel UK stuff reprinting okay. black and white the, versions yes, of classic absolutely. Marvel. Yeah. That was what he was working on. So he was doing all the covers. They had unique yes. covers. As, and in as, fact, the, as uh, the British ones do as well. You know, yeah. Like... There were dealers in the room selling his originals for like wow. crazy money. You know, yeah. he's, he's like very well respected. But he had also done a lot of original work for that with the Marvel characters. Oh, even, even working with Stan on some stories. Oh, I see. 
Yeah. Right. So, and, and in fact, and I, I haven't seen it, and I need to kind of do some more research and track this down, but mm-hmm. apparently he has done some work for Marvel US. So right. you can see some of this stuff. Anyway, he was there, and I, yeah, I didn't get to meet him until the Saturday night, and we had all been out and you know having a wonderful night but I had things to do on the Sunday morning so you know we we weren't too crazy I think that night we'd been out with uh, another friend that we met there called DJ and we were back by you know midnight or something Mm -hmm. and I was getting ready for bed just sort of you know checking my emails doing some stuff on the internet before I went to sleep and I I had a little bit of uh, hunger pangs so I thought I'm going to go down and just have a little snack and it was about you know 1 30 in the morning and it turns out that this artist who i'd kept missing had finally arrived home and they were all sitting around reading uh sorry uh drinking and, and what have you sure and they had this green liqueur that looked a lot like absinthe but was called something else which they had special uh-huh. glasses for that looked like little shot glasses with a handle so in other words you're meant to sip it sounds dangerous and then they had wine bottles with schnapps written over the label with this clear liquid in it and it was the the guy whose house we were staying in it was made by his 94 year old father homemade schnapps like 60 70 percent proof so what it's intense and so Hooch. This guy, Mitt Holm, is like, oh, Chris, pleasure to meet you. I've heard all about you. It's kind of like, oh, yeah, I've heard about you too. Yeah. And, uh, <laughs> and so we sit down and they, of course, make me join them for these drinks. And the next thing I know, it's 4.30 in the morning. Holy schmouse. And I've gone from being very good and with it and going, I'll call it a night now, to very, very drunk. You know, with this guy who seemed perfectly fine. <laughs> So, I was like, this guy's great. I've got to interview him. And we made plans to meet the next day at 12.30 to uh, do an interview over lunch. Lovely. But but his plan was like, yes, you know, we'll we'll meet for lunch. I'll teach you how to drink pastis. Ah. Yeah. Yes, the national pastime. So, um, sorry, it's a long story, but so... (laughs) We did meet up the next day at 12.30 and, and we were all there, fine and what have you. And so we sat down for lunch and we started with pastis, which is an aperitif. It is a delicious li- licorice flavor. Yeah, an aniseed uh, liqueur. And you water it down, right but yeah. to taste. Yeah. Uh, it's quite incredible. I, I wish you could get it more places because it's such a wonderful way to start Pair a meal. No. Pernod. Pernod, yes. That... Yeah. Ricard or Pernod. Yes, that's that's right. That's the, yeah. the brands, yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, Good and, stuff. And so we started with that. Wonderful. And then we had a bottle of red between us with lunch, had this great steak lunch. Lovely. And of course, you know the thing with how do you ask for your steak in France, Carl? Burnt. <laughs> On fire. <laughs> yeah. Because if possible. If you ask for it well done, and I, I would say it's. Medium, medium rare if you're lucky yeah yeah yeah, yeah but different, uh different tastes still amazing steaks and, and uh, sides of beef there and, and what have you so we had that and then he said right we need to finish with cognac and at no point have i been able to get him to start recording he's just teaching me to drink <laughs> and to keep up so this, we have this a, guy's great i want to meet him yeah <laughs> no you, you would you would love him and so we finished with a cognac and an espresso so he shows me the way to do that which is you shoot your espresso first you've got your little bit of crema and whatever sitting in the espresso uh cup yep. mug you then pour your cognac into that and hey. you get that flavor and i tell you it it makes a difference i bet it does and uh yeah so we didn't get to record then and i said well hey let's try and record something later tonight but in the brief time that I did get to see him, we drank together at the house and then he went off because he had to go and drink with other people. Uh, he Fantastic. was the unstoppable party machine, but yeah. the most spectacular guy. And I'm going to try and get him on the phone because... Um, Do it. You know, he, you should. We, we need to chat with I him. I want to talk to this guy. <laughs> yeah. The French Jack Kirby. And, and there you go. So again, that 
is the kind of thing you can also find in the Espace Parabede. Yeah, there is a whole lot of stuff going on mm. at that festival, including many screenings, talks, mm. uh, lots of interactive stuff. There's a there's a kind of a cosplay level, but it's very much kids. It's, yes. it's it, you know it's for fun. It's kids, and it's more dressing up as pirates or something. There isn't the whole culture, the cosplay culture that we experience here regularly as part of yeah sort of convention life, and that's fine. It's it's kind of it's refreshing, just a different approach yeah. again. Yeah, uh, because it's it's become such a staple part of uh, U.S. and U.K. cons that. You know, it's it's kind of nice that it's not there. Mm. Not in a bad way, cosplay <laughs> friends, but it's 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 just different. Um, one of the many talks that went on mm. was uh, Dylan Horrocks, who was talking about his new uh, was it Sam Zabel and the Magic Pen. The Magic Pen, and uh, I went to see that because it was conducted in English and they do actually like they they do offer headphones with translators oh, really? uh, you know at, at most of the talks but it's it's you know it's it's like headphones and it's kind of uncomfortable and mm. and so this was this was a great talk and Dylan actually did a number of talks including a Kirby retrospective which like uh, Dylan which was talking with, I think Rand Hop and the, yeah. the museum guys yeah 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 and uh that was fantastic it was a little bit of a sort of history and very interesting to hear him talk about his sort of trajectory mm. his his career trajectory how it went sort of going from self-published stuff he was based here in London in the 80s like I was kind of uh, interested right. because he 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 was in London sort of the same time I came over to London and right. um, you know squatting and so forth and doing self-published comics and what have you and then um, you know he eventually sort of got picked up by uh, Fantagraphics or Drone and Quarterly I think who were doing mm. um, his previous book which will need an edit I can't remember <laughs> No, I, it's, I, it, it, it's just gone. It's anyway, gone for me at the moment. Yeah, but yeah. Um, to you know, working for DC, and he ended up writing Batgirl, and he was very entertaining about like how you know he had this idea in his mind about Batgirl and uh, the sixties Batman TV show, yeah, and yeah. you know that was his idea of Batgirl, and then when. He actually came to work on the book. It was like this whole other thing. It was, it was the this, Cassandra, it, it Cain, was the Cassandra Cain story, and like that was a good gig, paying well, mm -hmm. and he stuck with it. But he was not writing stories that he wanted to write, and that caused him to sort of have a complete writer's block. And I've I've just unblocked now and saved the edit. Mm. Hicksville. Hicksville. That's there it. we go. Yeah. Um, so Hicksville, which you know, used to pick up as individual issues as it as it came out, mm -hmm. and you know his incredible sort of uh, writing about comics in a comic. You know, it's like Hicksville is his ideal place where everything mm. is sort of connected, and it's you know he based it in New Zealand where he's from, and you know. Uh, and where he is now again. Where he still is, yeah. yeah. And, uh, you know, then he, he, he sort of got this mainstream gig and eventually it sort of killed his creative urge and it took him literally 10 years to write his way out of it and that's what the Magic Pen is essentially about. Mm. It's based in the same world and, you know, great to sort of give a guy like a whole hour and a half to talk about this stuff it was, yeah it was great one of the many talks and uh, of course you know lots of screenings as well there were mm. um, well that's <coughs> that's one of the cool things as well is they're more unguarded or less guarded 
there, I, I find, particularly, you know, American or English-speaking yeah, creators. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, to flash yeah. back to last year, we had that yes. experience with the Paul Pope, Paul Pope, where he was... That was incredible. Yeah, he was, you know, just talking candidly. Yeah, uh, I, I did record that, and yeah. that's actually out, and I'll put a link back to that in the... Uh, your notes for this episode mm. it's a difficult listen because it was really hard to get a good recording of that so I apologize sure. but what he had to say was so good and and so different to what you would get from him at any US show it's like absolutely worth going back to to listen to yeah it's interesting the way the um, atmosphere is mm. completely you know more relaxed yeah. it's just more relaxed it, it really is just as a, a show mm. if we can talk about some of the stuff that goes on outside of the main show because you've got the Angoulême B-Day Festival but there are various fringe events going on around town like last year you had ARG were set up with their own kind of taking over a, a yeah. cafe bar ARG is a publisher they mm -hmm. do a lot of great stuff and uh, I think it was again it was their 10th anniversary maybe or right something like that so and they, yeah, they, they had taken over a, a bar basically yeah. Harry's American bar or something like that I can't like remember that. which one it is it but yeah I, I know where it is and, and yeah. I was hoping they were going to be there again because not only did they have great stuff, I mean, their stuff was fantastic. They had all these incredible prints for sale. They had the ARG magazine, which was on its just its second issue as far as yeah. actually being this, I think, quarterly mag. And, you know, now they're up to something like issue seven when we were there or something. Yeah. So either they've upped their frequency or, or what have you. But it was incredible. And I know I sat with whole group of the artists last year while they signed and, and uh -huh. did this dedications inside the, the magazine for me mm -hmm. um, but one of the, the big ones, I, I guess it's probably the biggest of the Fringe Festivals is, is FOF. Yeah let's talk about FOF can we say fuck off? Yeah, yeah okay, uh, we're allowed to swear? Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah, yeah plus well, this far, well, you know yeah, I mean that's, that's, that's what uh, the FOF is it's 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 fuck off Angoulême. That's where it came from. It I, I guess like I, I keep hearing it's it's like an urban legend though. There seems to be so many interpretations for what fof is. Well, if I point you to ah. the, the flyer <laughs> right. for this year's uh, fof, it's uh, okay. It's, it's spelled out there. Yeah, as I understand it, it it's like the people who didn't get to get tables in mm -hmm. the. Um, in in the indie show or the in in the Nouveau the Monde, Nouveau Monde. Uh, but who still wanted to represent at the festival, and so mm -hmm. a little alternative festival yeah. within the festival, which is very underground, anarchic, and like all encompassing. You know, yeah. there's, a, there, there's there's a venue every year. It, it's been the same venue for the last few years, but that could change. Um, and again, it's a, it's a great venue because essentially it's a bar as much as it is an actual event space. Yeah, so you've got like you've you've basically got a sort of a small press and zine mart. Yeah, fair in a bar and uh, then serving cheap booze, which is is great. One euro for a glass of wine. Yeah, it's just delightful. Yep. And they were even doing lunches there. Did I tell yeah, you about I that? Yeah, I, I, I've heard this. I've heard this. That, yeah. That, that's uh, yeah, they decent food, real cheap. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's quite cool, you know. And um, to be honest, you know, France is not a great place for vegetarians. Mm -hmm. I'm not actually vegetarian, but I often eat a lot of vegetarian food. And You're a wannabe. Yeah, yeah. I... But, but I, I want a way out. Yeah, I want to get out of jail free card. So, okay. like, today we could go for a roast lunch. But then I can also eat this sort of healthy vegetarian food at times. And they did this great vegetarian feast one day. It was like a giant plastic tub with beautiful, like, fresh hummus 
and this great vegetable curry and rice. Oh no, where uh, couscous it was. Ooh. And it was four fifty for that with wow. a glass of wine. And you know, as as lovely as all the food alternatives are, you're not really gonna get away for anything less than twenty euros elsewhere. So this yeah. was actually a wonderful option. Delicious. But but in there, what's really delicious is the what's what's available in yeah. there. It's it's not like it's not like anything else. It's it's the true underground, and you know, yeah. Um, these uh, is, there's tattooists, there's mm-hmm. uh, exhibitions. It's it's full. Oh, yeah. on, I wasn't even like, thinking about. There's that like, whole upstairs area with the yeah. immersive Ru- art experience. Yeah, yeah, where it's not like rooms a that you just 3D, shut it, but... shut into basically, and mm. it's wow. Yeah, I remember one that. Last year, I, I didn't go upstairs this year. I totally didn't think. But one last year, where you walked into the room, and essentially there was plants and foliage everywhere, and there was a path to follow through into a tent, and you would crawl down into yeah. the tent, and there was just <laughs> art all over yeah. the walls, and it was really take a moment and just soak it. Yeah, in. kind of Tracy Emin type thing, a little mm. bit, um, and then at night. Oh yes! At night they uh, they they, they kick things. all the artists out, and uh, they just have gigs. Yeah, basically. So they, well, I'm sure the artists all stay there just to drink. You know, it's probably the oh yeah, but I, in like town, I mean, their the, the stuff is on set. Tables, yeah, yeah, tables are all put away, and uh, yeah, there's some pretty intense concerts. Yeah, there. Yeah, everyone and, gets a set. You yeah, know, half hour yeah. to an hour, each. and it's free. You just walk in. And pay one euro for a uh, glass of wine. Yeah, and, and, you, and you pay for a, to uh, have your like a little deposit. Deposit on your glass. Yeah, yeah. For the glass. <laughs> yeah, it's it's so cool. Um, wouldn't happen at Comic Con. No, it's it's, I, I it's mean, they, very they left tried, field. And they have tried stuff like this. Like in San Diego, they have a thing uh-huh. called Trickster, which is okay. a slightly alternate festival happening, which. Is great for people that either can't get a table in Comic Con or don't want to pay the prices or whatever. Yeah, and it then doesn't rely on people to get tickets to get in. Okay, because Angoulême anyone can go, and in fact, there's more people that go to Angoulême than to San Diego. Right. Uh, the people I was staying with were saying about two hundred thousand were there, whereas Comic Con is about one hundred and forty or so thousand. Okay. Um, but in San Diego, they're doing more of these events because people are just missing out on tickets. Right, and there's right, these little yeah, fringe think. things happening, but mm-hmm. still, nothing as cutting edge as Foff. Yeah, it's it's great. Like I remember last year, one night the the one that made an impression was there was a great French hip hop duo, a guy and a girl. Uh-huh. Uh huh. This year they had a lot of really good like spoken word performances yes. and things to projections you know music and stuff to projections so there yeah. was an, an audio yeah, yeah. visual element great, great multimedia stuff you know yeah lovely yeah lovely. now it, it was pretty special and so there was lots of cool creators at FOF during the day you could pick up some great stuff uh, you're flicking through something you'd I tell. really uh, yeah I actually picked this up last year it's called Batman and Robin and uh, it's just uh, anarchic take on uh I suppose the Miller, the Miller Batman's. Um, it, it is because it's, it's, it's Harry like, Kelly Bat, uh, Robin. Sorry. Yeah, it's like three mini comics, which are, I want to say A seven. <laughs> they're, they're tiny. They're the size of a credit card, yeah. and uh, a cassette with some music, which I have yet to listen to, but I imagine it to be amazing, and uh, yeah. Again, yeah, that comes in just a little pack, so you've suddenly got three of yeah, them. Yeah, definitely. Because they're not four a, Batman and Robin comics, in Yeah, I think there's, there's four. Because there's one that's this, this is larger. volume four. Yeah. So it's like and, and a cassette. And just a cassette, yeah. Just beautiful. Uh, so nicely screen printed. It's really... This is this is a big thing, and Foff is sort of... A, I'm blown away by by what I find there every year it's uh, there's something special about the screen printing that these guys do it's uh, very lurid and really bright colours and just 
excellent paper and uh, there's also a lot of uh, guys who clearly do uh, posters for gigs so you've got a lot of yeah. you know bands stuff with just like what you know what what Coop and Kozik do uh, for the American bands when they when they come over to France these guys are clearly sort of hooked in and uh, I got an unbelievable brutal brutal truth poster which mm. you know is, is is going up last year we got uh, we got those uh, Iggy and the Stooges stuff yeah. which was um, like in the EC style in the EC style and it was like the most requested thing ever pre-code Iggy yeah <laughs> <laughs> it, was, it was good, yeah. It's uh, Foff is left field and uh, daring and outrageous. Yeah, we were going to talk about different things we picked up, our personal swag and whatever. Sure. I picked up a few interesting things in Foff. Uh, there was the Psoriasis anthology mm-hmm. that I picked up, and I think they're up to about their seventh edition. It's like yeah. an annual thing. They do screen printed covers on them as well as giving you a screen print with each copy that's yeah. sold. So the level of craftsmanship going into this is amazing. But they yeah. screen printed all the covers. And so I picked one up and was saying to the girl that I'd like to buy this. And, you know, of course, there's that whole thing of I really need to practice my French. <laughs> she was so very nice to me. And then she took my copy off me and went through the stack that was there. And she said, I would like you to take this one because it's a much nicer one this is this is the best of this you know group here and, mm-hmm. and you know they they want to have the best presentation and then when i asked her yeah. about her story in there she showed me explained it to me and then you know was more than happy to do a dedication amazing for me yeah. and you know the the level of work that went in then there was another comic i picked up called bite man <laughs> Uh, I, you know, it could be like BT Man. I, I have no idea. Okay. I'm, I'm going with Bite Man, and the artist on it was Toto. Okay, not the band that did no, Africa. Like, yeah, yeah. But uh, it, this was incredible, and it looked. It was in the style of pre-code comics, but pre-code sort of superhero. So okay. you're very classic superhero type of things. But he's a a dashing chap in a top hat who. At, at a very cursory glance, if you look very quickly, it looks like he's kind of got a tail that he uses for everything. Except right. that it's a tail on the front. Okay, <laughs> that kind of tail. Yeah, but it's but it's all black, just like his tuxedo. And it's, it's very strange, and he uses it to swing and to grab <laughs> villains with and all of this. So it's this okay. seemingly innocent, innocuous kind of, you know, old vintage superhero thing but actually with a quite a subversive edge and the guy who was selling it to me I, I was chatting with him and he represented this sort of group of artists and the artist wasn't there but he was saying you would be very interested to know that the artist of this book is a woman <laughs> <laughs> so Toto was a lady which um, yeah. I, I would not have thought of but uh, I guess I, I, yeah. I, I've got to say uh my knowledge of French slang has improved oh. over the uh, years. And uh, does, does Toto mean something? Or no, but beat means something. Right. As in B-I-T. Yes. Yeah. Penis? Cock. Cock. Cock man. Right. Yeah. <laughs> okay. There you go. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So that, that makes total sense. Yeah. There you go. Bizarrely, la beat is the cock. Which is uh, oh. French have uh, you know male and female nouns, right? So ah, le, le, yeah, whatever. Uh, but the cock is la bite. Wow, that's just, a bit I, of strange. I know. Yeah, I, I'm just making that gender up. and really. Yeah, I was kind of liking I'm that. Totally but I, actually, <laughs> w- it, it makes sense as well that she'd gone this route because it uh, it did actually look like the very early Batman comic. So. Beat, yeah, beat per- man. fits there fits right go. in. Fits yeah. right in, baby. And uh, yeah, I, I was going to say with the whole Toto thing, we're not in Kansas anymore. <sighs> um, Too much. There, there was another artist there, uh, Teo Kamajan. 
uh-huh. who did some great comics. These were actually all ages things. It was like a okay, a, like a boys' mystery kind of thing. But yeah. that were sensational. Like the beautiful art on them was just like wow. And then there was a, of course, the, keeping up with the international thing. There was a German um, collective that were there selling comics on behalf of a whole bunch of artists. You know, some of whom were there. And there was a guy called Martin Ernsten who uh-huh. has a series called Wrong Person. And they're kind of <laughs> autobio comics done in English and in talking about traveling to Angoulême. Wow. Wow. So I picked up one of them. Yeah. Yeah. There's Amazing. lots of good stuff there. There is. I mean, it's, it's, it's a truly international festival in, uh, in Le Nouvel Monde. There's the Finnish comics collective there's the Swedish guys there's the German guys there's the Italian guys there's the Spanish people it's like it's really you know interesting to mm. see there's there's different scenes all of which are you know it's wonderful yeah yeah you just you, you don't get that over here no no exactly it's, <clears throat> it's such a global and universal look at comics yeah yeah <laughs> Yeah, what, That's, what is it you've got this, there? I, I, uh, something I picked up at Foff called Le, uh, Lancelent, the insolent one. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, this it, it basically makes me think of the butthole surfers. You know, mm-hmm. it's, 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 it's like a zine. It's beautifully screen printed on say, probably yeah. about 20, 20 pages. Not, and not it's, what it, you it's, think it's, of at first of a zine because no, the quality is just... Like immaculate superior but yeah it's like the aesthetic yeah the insolent yeah, yeah. which is, is great and incredibly reasonable when you think about it, like what they're charging for this and I, I don't know absolutely I, I don't know if that's something about France like because they're so accepting of art perhaps there's a lot of this and therefore there's competition yeah. and so they can get stuff printed cheaper or, or something I mean that would probably make sense but yeah, I don't know. I guess you know, there's a lot of collectives and what have you. People sort of chipping in, but mm. yeah. Overall, Foff is definitely it's it's like a little Easter egg within an amazing feast. You know, yeah. it's like the the whole festival is for comics people mind blowingly good. Unless you're a really narrow minded moron, it's just. Amazing, yeah. and then like the foff is for people who dig the underground and edgy stuff. It's just like you, I've 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 got home. I've come home to heaven, yeah, or whatever you know. And and again, it's it's not even that. Like it's you know, if if you dig comics, it's something you should just go and look at anyway because there's just great stuff there. You don't have to be a particular type or into Absolutely. a certain genre or whatever. It's you. There, there is actually something for everybody there, but you it's will true. see a lot of really interesting stuff on the way to finding whatever yep. fits you. For sure. Mm. Absolutely. So, Angoulême. Well, it's an experience we, we... you really need to put into your life at least once. If if you think you're a fan of mm. comics, if you if you love it. We, we did say, and, and to finish off, we were going to mention a little bit more about our swag. And yeah. it reminded me of the one place that we didn't mention so far, because it's not part of the festival as such, but uh, do you know where I'm talking about, Carl? I think I might. It doesn't even have a name. No, it doesn't. Uh, I, I might call it the shed or the garage, but it's literally uh, what uh, would have been an abandoned shop front yeah, it's with a, roller it's, doors it's on it. Yeah, it's Yeah, it's an abandoned shop front with roller doors on it. It's a squat. <laughs> yes. It's, it, yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's basically a squat. And uh, there's probably what two or three dealers set up in there? Two but or it's three the same. D- two or three guys. Yeah, they've you know, I've been they have been the same guys or yep, so forth for the last two or three years. And it's a treasure. It's Aladdin's cave. It is. And again, it's like that thing where you know, they're not charging a fortune for it. Maybe it's because the overheads are lower being yeah. outside the main festival, etc. Yeah. But you can score some genuine bargains. Absolutely. Definitely hard to find um, French publications. Out of print stuff and, and not final. just comics. 
yeah, there's there's a whole vinyl section as well with all sorts of wonderful albums. You know, the obvious things you would expect, and then lots of great French stuff. So some Serge games yeah. that you French don't pressings. see so much. Absolutely. The kind of place that weeks after you've come home, you regret not making a purchase Every of time. that particular version of the so soundtrack what, what, from... What is it you can remember this? I can't. I, I, I'm, I can't. I'm crying okay. inside. I, the, I can the remember. The soundtrack for Empire. Right, yes. A French edition, a French LP of the soundtrack for Empire for 20 euros yeah. on vinyl. Why, why did I not buy that? Yeah. It's not going to be there next year, is it? I can think of stuff where I doubted, like... So the first year, um, my first year, should I say, they had a copy of Le Strumpf Noir. Oh, the Black Smurf. The Black Smurf. The outrageous Smurf. Yeah. And, um, you know, I have a soft spot for this. And uh, so I missed that copy. Luckily, this year, they did have a... Was it a Kubrick or... Mega figure or something of what? the, the blacksmith. Yeah, you remember? No way. I bought it in the. Yeah, you were with me on the first day. In that the, was uh, that wasn't a Kubrick. That was that was him. But but of him wasn't a Kubrick. It wasn't a him? Kubrick. What no. was it? It was it was that, that was the blacksmith. There you go. But yeah, it was the blacksmith. So I, I managed to get a figure of him mm-hmm. this year for five euros, which was there you such go. a bargain. Five Again. euros is the best price. But then this year, inside the little squat shop. Yep. <laughs> Uh, it doesn't had, have a name. They had the. It's on the main street, though. Two books that Terry Dodson had originally done for the French market that is a correct. number of years ago uh, from the, the song series, mm-hmm. I think, Coraline. Mm-hmm. And, mm-hmm. and I, I, you know, I, I deliberated because I've, I've got them in English, but as we explained, the French versions are always superior. It, it's just a fact. Unquestionably. And so I was thinking, should I, should I not get them in French? And of course, the day I decided I'm going to go get them, they were gone. Yep, that's how it goes. So sad. But that is the nature of purchasing at a festival or convention. But you were able special to stuff get is there. It's like it's you know, it's like yeah. a rock festival, you know. You got you got the guy who's selling the bootlegs. Well, it, since you mentioned bootleg, uh one thing that we did pick up at a, a fringe event that is very rare, very incredible, and somehow fits in with my discussion of Le Strumpf Noir is Tintin in the Congo. Tintin, in Congolese. Tintin Akai Congo, which, yeah, this is a version of the book in Congolese. Which you is may... completely illegal. We really shouldn't be talking about it, but we are. Yeah, this is towards the end of the episode, so this is like the little bonus if you've got this far. We have a couple of copies of these in at the shop, but this was something that I desperately wanted to get for myself, and I think is how we ended up deciding to get some for here because perhaps other people would feel like me you know this that of, of course look it's it's a racist book and in hindsight this does not work at all and i think even Hergé felt bad about it as he learned more afterwards and it's why as he should yeah it's why later tintin stuff is more sensitive exceptionally well and well researched, researched. Which we which talked is, about this earlier. Yeah, yeah. We, we have this discussion just here at the shop because that's the kind of cool thing we do. We could essentially record an in-conversation by recording our conversation. Yeah, sure. Let's just do that. <laughs> it's it's amazing. Off. But I, I think by having a version in Congolese, it's it's almost like reappropriating it, reclaiming it in mm-hmm. a way. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and it is that subversive element, but quite amazing. Yep. It's out of print. These guys are bootleggers. They are nasty, evil people. And they they previously did this version. It's a thing they've been doing every year for the last few years. Right. They, the year Art Spiegelman was the president. Yes. Uh, they did, which was the year that Meta Mouse came out. Mm-hmm. They did a version of Mouse, but all the mice were cats. So... <laughs> <laughs> you know, and and that was like they, that was clamped down upon immediately mm-hmm. and pulped. They had to pulp the wow. entire print run. So yeah, this would be in a similar thing if this ever got out there. Yeah, 
into the wild, but it's, it's yeah. Slightly... I don't know what the status of it is now. I don't want to know. No, I know nothing. No, I no, we, we, I don't know. Don't you. know. Who, who, who are you? What is this? What happened? What book? Who? Tintin. Where who's... are we? Tanta. <laughs> um, but you coming back to the squat shop? You managed to pick up some really cool stuff. I guess probably some for you, but also some for the shop and for the yep. the boutique web store that is coming. Yep, I sure did. I've uh, picked up a number of copies of a Chali Menswell, which was like the precursor to Chali Abdo. Um, this is the monthly one, isn't it? It's the monthly version. It's uh, some great, great reprints of, uh, for example, Andy Cap. And uh, that's appropriate after peanuts. this wine, yeah, yeah. Um, but then sort of dropped in with this is like uh, real proper French underground stuff like Pichard and uh, you know, things that were uh, subsequently picked up by Metal Hulin and Heavy Metal and you know, redistributed. Um, this is where Charlie Hebdo started, and it's uh. Really lovely newspaper format. Sl- uh, later yeah. on, I mean, this is this is seventy stuff, and you know, this stuff, as as we say, is going to be going up on the web store. Uh, yeah, what is this one? The this one is Bede Lebdo de la Bede. Like so, so it's it's like a weekly a weekly strip comics. Yeah, <laughs> and 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 this uh, has bizarrely Star Hawks by Gil Kane and Ron Gula. Uh, next to the forty-year-old hippie by Ted Richards, you know, followed up with Adele Blanc Sec. Wow! Which you know, it, it's it's just like right across the board. Um, really great vintage French. Uh, yeah, they're going to be on sale. Fantastic. I don't know. We don't have many of them, but uh, you know, they'll be up there. Some some special things. I I know for me. Sorry, folks, this isn't going to be on sale, but I did pick up some nice little swag for myself. Like, uh, I wanted to get some nice French editions of Crepax. Ooh. And so uh, they in the, the squat shop, I've decided on that name. It seems to fit for now. Perfect. Um, I pick up the volume that Crepax did of Emmanuel. Dirty. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> it is, but that's just Crepax. But... It's the Glorious. only volume he did. Gloriously dirty. And, you know, it's it's a one-off, which is, is great. So I wasn't buying into one of his series or, or what have you. It stands on its own. Hasn't been reprinted in 20-something years, etc. And adapts the original Emmanuel stories, which was kind of cool. I also managed to pick up uh, Mobius's... Uh, well, Mobius and Jodorowsky's uh, Link à Noir. Uh-huh. Jodorowsky. Big yeah. friend of Kanye. Yes, <laughs> have you saw that? Yeah, <laughs> Kanye respecting the artistry and explaining yeah. why he loves Jodorowsky. Yeah, um, but not Beck, which is very. He's sad. a Scientologist. Is he? Yeah. Are you serious? Sure. Ah, okay. Uh, Him and Neil Gaiman should do a comic together. Well, <laughs> they kind of are a comic, aren't they? Yeah. <laughs> Um, I also picked up a blueberry, but then here we go. This was the interesting thing. I thought it was a volume of blueberry when I was pulling it out, but there was another cowboy <laughs> one that Jean Giraud had done, Jim Cutlass. Okay, yeah, have you ever seen? I've it? heard yeah. of it. Yeah. A book called Mississippi River, which was kind of cool, and then a uh, Juillet uh, Lail. How do you spell it? L A I L. Lai. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Cool. Duillet. Yeah. Philippe Duillet is my man. He's like, I love that guy's stuff. Yeah. Uh, there's, you know, there was a big exhibition last mm. year at Angoulême of yes, his stuff. Of which course. You know, you was know, that like the, the Glen Art Gallery, yeah, I think? it was the Glen Art Gallery. And yeah. Yeah. You know, all these guys, they were sort of fundamental in bringing the whole medium forward by forming... Um, Les Humanoids mm. Associé exactly. and putting out Metal Hollande, which is, you know, uh, subsequently the American franchise so was heavy metal. metal. Mm-hmm. Um, but the original guys, Philip Duillet, uh, Moebius, and, you know, subsequently Richard Corbin and so forth, just doing what they wanted to do. Yeah. And, you know, that's like. Which was amazing. Yeah. And it's now sort of fundamentally. 
being appreciated, and that's great. Yeah, well, the, the Douye stuff, I remember my friend showing me Lone Sloan when I was, like, <laughs> yeah, a, a kid, you know, like 10 or 11 years old, and just mind-blown, seriously. Yeah. And, you know, I, I don't know what their editions are going to look like, but I was kind of excited to hear Titan are actually reprinting Lone Sloan. Fabulous. Starting... Um, now, they solicit ridiculously far ahead, so it's probably not till later this year, but it's in the current previews. And actually, that excited me, because... As the, the recurring theme, uh, Lani Polchen for my getting my French right, but for now I read in English, uh-huh. and so I will properly be able to read these again for the first time since I was a kid. Wicked ass. I'm actually just about to put up a couple of editions of Lone Sloan, hey. which was translated and published by Dragon's Dream years ago. Uh, they're going up on the web store, so you could probably buy one from the web store. From the web store? Yeah. By the way, that's not a plug for you guys. That's actually Carl just telling yeah. me that I could personally get on there. And, and a plug one. for you guys as well, because... It's coming. Know, it's coming. Yeah, yeah. So, there we go. That's that's the that's, end of our French war. Yeah, the uh, gas. The, the wine has gone. The cheese, uh, cheese is, is, is going. Going. And uh, so are we. But thank you so much for hanging in there with us. Uh, I hope that us discussing Angoulême has kind of inspired you to want to go. And by all means, it's just across the channel. It's not that hard, really. And Man, you... it's so easy to get there. Yeah. And it's just a great week. Do it. Yes. And to finish out the show, as I said, I've got a nice little chat with Paul Gravett talking about uh, his experiences with Angoulême and his history with the show. We'll see you next week. Je suis tardi. All right, so I'm here with Paul Gravett. On who... the orbital sofa. Yes, I'm on, on the it. orbital sofa. I think sofa. it's the first time on the orbital sofa. This is quite literally... My buttocks orbital. are enjoying this, actually. Oh, it's this nice is and good. Soft, nice and soft, and, but supportive. <laughs> <laughs> That's kind of like us exactly. at Orbital, you know. I think that, that nice that's your new quite tagline. supportive, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and plumptious. <laughs> it's, it's all coming together. Do you, do you want to take over the marketing for us? I, yes. I think there's a position there. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, I, I thought it would be good to get you on. We, we tried to hook up in Angoulême, mm. but obviously it's a big, expansive place. There's yeah. a lot going on. The chances of that, you know aren't that good because you have the best of intentions but there's a million things to distract you yeah and a million people to see Mm. however we can talk about Angoulême after the fact Mm -hmm. and so I want to do that now Mm. now before we talk about this year you've actually got quite a rich history with Angoulême Mm. and were part of sort of that early British invasion so I wanted to ask about when you first went over and when Uh that was and what it was like yeah in, I first went over in 84, um, when you were a mere twinkle, Chris, a mere <laughs> twinkle. And, uh, oh, that's so nice. And I went, my, I went in my short trousers, no, I didn't actually, because I was actually, but I went there with Peter because we were doing Escape, Escape began in 83, and uh, we were the only Brits there. Yeah, at that stage, um, the Angolan Festival was being run by Pierre Pascal, who spoke like this, and it was very ebullient, and, but very, very French, and... Um, a person and the point was that it was calling itself international, but and it was of course it had Well Eisner had been there in the years before and they'd had other big names etc. Mm. But it wasn't really very international. Um, um, that said, Uncle M was it was a different place back in 1984 because uh, there's a lot of money, a lot of money behind it, um, and they were incredibly generous with the, the press. I mean, mm. it was slightly embarrassing. We, I don't know how much I ought to tell you about this, but we ended up with um, you had. They gave you meal vouchers, wow! And they laid on lavish sort of um, spreads for the press, so in, uh, um, for, for exhibition openings. They had gigantic cakes in the shape of comics and things when they were opening exhibitions and things. And you could get change. You didn't spend all the money on the voucher. You got cash back. And we sort of thought, this is insane. Wow! So yeah. it was. It was a different era when there was. A, there's, mm-hmm. And in fact. Angoulême is an enormous subject. There's enough for a, a full novel, really, because um, there's been all sorts of corruption and mayors being run out of 
disappearing to South America and God wow. knows and it's been it's, and it continues to be a pretty complicated place politically well, well, and financially well there's that whole thing as well with yeah. the is it the current head of Angoulême the, the festival mm. itself and there was some petition as far as you know in support of him because there were people trying to run him out so yeah, yeah. this continues that actually was the, there was Gilles Simon who was the director uh, ousted from the Cité and the museum as opposed to the festival the festival uh, right. the two things are not the same thing there's, a, there's an organisation called Ninth Art which deals with the festival runs that and quite separately there's the obviously full all year round museum and centre and uh-huh. running there as well so it's, it's a pretty complicated setup. but it was an amazing the first year was Tardy Tardy was the guest was the featured artist wow. and the exhibition was brilliant it's the first time I'd ever actually worn headphone things where they were kind of it, somehow radio signal connected so whenever you went mm-hmm. into a different room you got a different soundtrack oh, and wow. I remember walking down in um, with Peter Stanley with me walking down into a kind of mock trench and you looked over the, the, mm-hmm. the top and you could see the artwork from it was the War of the Trenches and mm. things and yeah that was just and we'd never seen exhibitions of comics like that and the scale of it even then of course it was it's much bigger now it was, was incredible um, so yeah that was and, and basically I've been every year except one year and I'm, I'm, I'm really annoyed that I missed that one year because it was a year when um, they had a big show on George Harriman on Crazy Cat wow. and many many other, other other big things and that was one year I, for some reason I could, couldn't make it but yeah and so Angoulême continues to amaze and be, has become very international now, hugely mm-hmm. international, to the point where you're sort of standing around in the Chanoir or the Mercure and you're thinking, I'm, there are people here from practically every continent. Um, and it's fantastic for building up connections and friendships and, and projects. Uh, it's just, you know, at the end of January, what else are you going to do? It's, and yeah. For me, it's just like, you know, if New Year's a bit grim and you go, oh God, it's January, get me through January, Angoulême is just going to give you an energy for... for than the next year if not the next oh, decade oh yeah I was going to say time. <laughs> it gives you the boost every yeah. time I go yeah. I mean well it was only my second time yeah. this year but yeah. the did you go the first time boost, last year? yeah 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 so, so the mm. boost that I got last year off it just mm. kind of going oh man comics are just bigger than even the stuff that we have in the store you know there's the whole mm. French market oh my god there's more motivation to you know practice my French and, and get mm. that back up to speed or, or yeah. get it up to speed mm-hmm. you know it's uh, yeah. it, it is encouraging and then this yeah. year again was even better you you discover new things I mean there's mm. such a back catalogue of stuff there that mm. We couldn't hope to know all of, at no. least not yet. But no, 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 no. Yeah, no, so no. much to discover. When you've got something like now, because the market has changed enormously. The last sort of maybe sort of 13, 14 years or so, there's been every year an increase in the output of comics in France to the point where, I mean, back in the 80s, there used to be a, a thing that came out for a few years called the, the Year of the Comics, Anne de la Bonne a kind of guide, and it would kind of sum up what was going on, give you a kind of inventory of the new titles and things and back then it was like thought to be growing because it was maybe going to about 500 600 titles coming out a year now we're at over 5000 titles wow and uh, you know that's an average of 100 a week it's kind of stabilized and it's kind of like a bubble that's kind of like wobbling around a bit because is it going to burst no but the numbers have kind of gone up a little bit this year, this past year, 2014, but the sales aren't necessarily matching that. So mm. got, this is the whole challenge, just having you know, more, more product, but not necessarily the sales volume going up. So it's all a question yeah. of too much and what's going to happen. But um, it's incredible things still coming out. Yeah. So from talking to and then at least from what you've heard, is it the fact that there's so many titles that literally the numbers are spread across a wider plane, mm. or is there also less people buying them as well? Good question, and I'm not sure I know that answer. I mean, mm. the point is, what when the market, as in most countries, of course, it's got they've got the mega sellers, and whether it's an Asterix or it's a Titter or it's a New Tardy or something, which are you know in in the high numbers. And the problem is, it's the the the, the other stuff that sometimes only gets one week's sort of face mm. out if they're lucky visibility in the in the BD shops in France or in maybe in, in the, the, some of the, the chain shops and the Fanax and things and then it disappears and if it doesn't get mm-hmm. covered and this is a real challenge um, I probably can tell you I mean I had a nice chat with uh, uh, Jessica Abel who's based right. over there of course yes. with Madden with them and their kids and her new graphic novel is about, about roller derby and it's come out from Dargo it's called Trish Trash first of three volumes and it's you know she's um, got that she's facing the reality that she, but she, her, her book is just one of many many books mm-hmm. and will can it get noticed will it reach a public and is the publisher behind it 
with this much product turning around, you know, do they mm. do they put more attention to one or the other? So this is a weird situation. We, you know, we're here in Britain. We're going, oh, yeah, we've we we've got a pretty good scene, but we're not kind of struggling with too much product. Not really in the same no. way that the French are. The yeah. French have a crisis of overproduction. They've had it for a while now, and it's it's exciting, quite positive that that it, it hasn't been a collapse, but there is going to have to be. It's it's a challenging time. Mm. It's a challenging time for authors, and it's one of the kind of less reported sides of Uncle Lem is there was I think even last year there was a documentary um, made about the struggle of artists working in comics and actually that they're not there are all kinds of issues about this including benefits from the state and, and contributions towards pensions and stuff that I don't fully understand but basically you know they are struggling to make a living there's yeah. only so many of the people that, that can actually make a living doing this so the point is it, Uncle Lem it has all kinds of effects on people because it can be a uh, few me. I think probably it's wow because we're not well, we're not we're not making comics, Chris. Mm-hmm. So we just see oh more comics to buy and more comics to discover. But I know for some comic creators it can be very very inspiring. It also be pretty intimidating because oh my yeah. god it's all been done. Yeah. What can I add to all of this? Um, uh, and that that can be a problem I think. Um, and the great thing about it is just simply the variety of uh, that it's not for just for the diehards the fans the price is low enough yeah. to get in um, and you get everybody going along uh, oh, you know, yeah. all, whole families uh, collectors but also kids etc just a lovely big mixture and I think one of, one of my favourite tents not that I made, made it there actually this year unfortunately was they have a very good section for what they call the Jeune Creators Young Creators mm-hmm. tent yes, which yes. is really supportive because they've got obviously schools for how to make comics they do a competition mm. um, and it's and the publishers they can meet publishers face to face and these are people in there these are teenagers maybe who are just wanting to who Probably, I mean, frankly, some of them are, are so advanced. Basically, they're yeah. you know they've they've been reading comics all their life, making them all their life so far, and there's a real support network. You know, that there's a kind of way of feeding them into the um, to, to publishers and finding their feet mm. and being discovered. Uh, that's a, that's something we could do, with, I think, over here a bit more of. Quite honestly. Absolutely, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah that's only one. That's only one of the aspects. Um, and this year, I was particularly interested in the. Um, there's a very good section for China, a China pavilion that had some yes. amazing artists in. Yeah, that was a new tent. This yeah, year. the Chinese pavilion, um, and uh, there were quite a few. It, the publishers, amongst the publishers I met, I was pleased to meet uh, an interesting Mexican publisher. And that's the first okay. time in all the years I've ever met anybody from Mexico doing mm. coming from a, a literary house, a bit like a kind of Jonathan Cape, if you like, who's wanting, who's published quite interesting books. I think he did. Um, Maybe black hole and uh, some other other material, okay. and, but also originating new stuff from from Mexico and trying to kickstart the Mexican graphic novel scene. Mm. So that was good, yeah. And always, of course, there's never a time to see all the exhibitions. I mean, the, the big, <laughs> the big four major ones, obviously, with with uh, Gio Taniguchi, uh, a big one on Kirby. But of course, people were a little bit mis. Some people were disappointed that it was reproductions, but it was mm-hmm. only on for the weekend. It was in a, in a public space. And they all have to go back because next year, next summer, the museum, the Comics Museum, is going to have um, a Kirby show with original artwork. Right. So that will be on during the summer rather than at the at the, the course at the festival. So you have to make a pilgrimage there. Okay, yeah. but that's certainly worth it. I mean, yeah. I yeah. I had that experience. The Kirby exhibition was amazing, but mm. there was that slight disappointment in that oh, mm, mm. none of these are actually originals. But they're very well. The scans were amazing, weren't they? I mean, they were impeccable yeah. scans. Yeah. You know, yeah. they were artist edition level scans, yeah. Yeah. but they blew them up yeah. further. Yeah, and, and so that was great. So you're really being able to look at giant sized Kirby's, yeah, yeah. perhaps how he imagined them in his head, really. Actually, yes. And yes. the the <laughs> level of respect there is unlike anything you yeah. get here in the yeah. states. You yeah, know? exactly. Yeah, and of course they they they'd done a remarkable job on the, the Charlie Hebdo exhibition that was in the museum because of course it's only oh, been, yeah. it was only you know, a couple of weeks or so since the the, the, the murders in Paris and um, I met had a chance to go around with the curator Jean Pierre Messier took a few few us around on the um, the night before it actually opened mm. and I had I just hadn't it was astonishing how much they managed to put together in such a short time exactly yeah. the amazing video clips and I hadn't forgotten that. Um, Charlie Hebdo was one of the first places where, um, or maybe was, uh, and Harry Curie, which was the other magazine that came that was connected, is where Mobius was, was first publishing, even way way back right. before, yeah, yeah. even by the time he was doing Blueberry, and yeah, lots of incredible and very <laughs> shocking material as well, which only they could get away with, and it was a very very powerful show. And then of course the other wonderful show everyone loved, I think, was the Moomin one. That was the Moomin yeah. show was beautifully designed, um, and again. I curated a Moomin show in 2010 in, in uh, Brussels 
uh, but this one has got uh, material, far more material, wonderful things. Yeah. Um, and th that is on until October, so that's that's great. But, oh, um, so that's that still available still get, for people to, to go and visit the, the, the museum. As used to Charlie exactly. Hebdo once. The museum, there, of course, mm. is there all year round. Yeah. Mm. No, those were both amazing. Mm -hmm. uh, did you catch any of the other exhibitions at all then that were around? Like, I think there was the Kinky and Cozy one. No, um, unfortunately, I didn't. That, that's just the trouble. And that this is the main problem. If you there is a, as you know, you get, and this is one of the things why I think they could still be more international, but there isn't enough. Um, information in English is that there's a program, an agenda for mm -hmm. hour by hour for the festival, but it's not in English. Maybe there's an app or something, maybe it's online, but they, they seem to have been slightly, they moved away, they were becoming more bilingual and they've become a bit less bilingual. I don't think I would complain yeah, about that. Yeah. Um, for people who don't read French, it can be a bit of a problem for knowing what's going on. But that hour by hour program just, I don't, I don't like looking at it because I just get depressed because I, I can't be there and there <laughs> and there. I want to go to all five things. So the, my only real regret, and I would like to have seen the Kinky and Cozy show, I would love, I missed seeing Junji Ito. Did you know oh, he was even there? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I mean Uzumaki and uh, Gio, those, those, I love, he's one of my favourite manga horror artists. So, damn, basically. <laughs> yeah. There are so many pluses, and part of these things are things you can't plan, the chance encounters you have, and if you wander around the lights area where mm. all the publishers are, you discover people there. So there are so many pluses to it. Yeah. Well, I met a guy this year called mm. uh, Jean-Yves Mitton. Oh, yeah. Um, and and he drew Photon and other, oh, Micron, maybe Micron. But these, these, are, these, are, these were French superhero characters. Yeah. And for Senec. And he did uh, Strange or Strange? Strange, isn't it wonderful? Strange. Which I, I'm assuming <laughs> I is essentially their Marvel UK. Yeah, so all is. the Marvel reprints. Exactly, it's Marvel France, yes. And so he was the cover artist. Strange, yes. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> it's so French. It's, it's, it's suddenly, a bit strange. Yes. It's elevated, yeah, <laughs> strange. And um, he had done some original stuff as well. And, yeah, and things they had, I hadn't they, well, heard about. had really good, like, good covers. They, they, mm. they, 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 uniquely, unique French covers that we had, I guess, for Marvel UK. So here. yeah, yeah, he was staying where I was staying. Oh really? And oh, that's um, nice. I kept missing him because he was always out, seventy yeah. years old, and more vital and alive wow. than all of us put together. Wow! And I finally got to meet him one night at the house. It was about two a.m., mm -hmm. and they were getting stuck into something that looked suspiciously like absinthe, uh -huh. along with this very strange clear liquid in a wine bottle that was just labeled schnapps oh yeah and this was like homemade schnapps oh my god potent you know 60 70 percent they're telling me <laughs> it removes uh, rust from corrugated iron roofs as well, yeah by the way yes a and next thing i knew it was 4 30 in the morning and he was mm. all like yes and he's like right tomorrow at 12 30 you're meeting me for lunch and i'm going to teach you to drink pastis oh god <laughs> Yes, I had that as well. Yes. And we did, although... Yes. Um, I'm surprised you're here at all, really. I, I know, I, I <laughs> was not place. in good shape that next day, you know, <laughs> that was kind of my hair at the dog. You started when... to be basically embalmed, I think, sort of, mm. yeah, self-embalming, yes. But me told just fine, wow, yeah. Wow, wow, wow. yeah. And what is he doing these days? Is he doing well, he was recreations there with... or new comics or... He, I think he's doing some recreations. Yeah. I don't know whether he's doing new stuff, but he was there with a publisher, and I can't remember their name. They're a new boutique publisher, oh. essentially doing uh, kind of French artist editions. Mm. Very limited run, mm -hmm. say 300 copies, and they're reproducing a classic uh, bidet book. Mm -hmm. So there was one volume of Rick Hoche that they oh, yeah. were doing. Mm -hmm. Rick Hoche, yeah. And then they had uh, oh, a, a volume of Thorgal, where they had got as Back much the of the original art, original art oh, as oh, possible, really? scanned it, it's higher size, you know, yeah. sort of, I, I don't know if it was exact size, but no. much larger. But then they'd gone and commissioned new pinups and mm. artwork from some classic artists, mm. including Maton. Excellent. And that sort of filled out the volume, mm. and each mm. one would come with a signed and numbered print. Like they, they were Very beautiful nice. books. Yeah, I think... Yeah, yeah. Uh, Mm. You know, they were sort of 120, 150 euros each. So right. it was quite... So like the IDW editions. Yeah, yeah, yes, essentially. Yes, I, yeah. I guess, yeah, the, the comparison is there, but mm. even more limited run. Yeah, yeah. And so there were a new publisher, first year there, uh, and he was there with them. Brilliant. Um, brilliant. Signing at their table. Yeah. I mean, Mitchell was somebody who deserves, you know, a show of his own, you know, a retrospective. Mm. He's done it because he had a big impact with these, with the stuff for, for, for the Marvel comics. And, and as I say, also these uniquely 
uh, unique French superhero characters that came yeah. up, through as well. There's been a bit about them. I think Jean-Marc Lafissier did did um, maybe some maybe some translations of them. There were there's so okay. a few of them had sneaked out ah. uh, in English. Yeah. yeah, that I would kind like kind of to see. Went. Yeah, mm. well, I, I think he's done some work for Marvel proper as well. Oh, know, right. as well. So oh, good. I'm kind of keen to track down some of this yeah. stuff, and, and yeah. still to track him down for a chat. Because while we were there, whenever we were together, it was just another opportunity to have a drink. As far as actually saying, let's record something. He's like, yeah, here we go, have this, and it just <laughs> never happened, uh-huh. despite his keenness. So. Yes. But yeah, there are, are you those... in touch with him then? Have you got an email for him or something? Uh, I do, yes. yes. Oh, right. okay. So I can Great. stay in touch and follow yeah. that up. Yeah. And uh, so, yeah, that's those kind of chance encounters Absolutely. you're talking about. Yeah, that's the magic. That's the magic. Mm. Yeah, yeah. Because there's, think about it, the odds are you've got so many people from the whole world coming together in one place who all love comics. It's just, um, yeah, it's the, the, you're going to meet amazing people mm. yeah, wherever you go. So how about for you? Were there any mm. new discoveries of you, uh, like for you with people? Like I, I do know that mm. when I saw you getting on the train back from Angoulême to Paris, you had found someone that was doing some sort of an internship. Or yeah. A... No, his name was Jackson Reese. I must have a pretty good name for memories because uh, memory for names or name for memories. Um, <laughs> because yeah, he's yeah a young guy. I he showed me some. He's doing some stuff in. New Statesman. Right. I was a bit rude, actually, because he'd done this kind of portrait of how many leaders have we got? Probably three or four leaders. I mean, Clegg and Cameron and Miliband and Farage. And I said, oh, that's very... I can't... Which one's which? Oh, you can tell by the... You can tell by the ties. He had put the colours on the ties. Oh, really? Uh, and he's done in a kind of watercolour style. Sorry, Jackson, if you listen to this, it's, you're, very, you're sure you're very, very good. I'm very bad at <laughs> spotting politicians, I bear, because they all look a bit alike, after all. Yeah. Them, anyway, frankly... I uh, haven't got much. They're all a bit identical, but yeah, he's he's got a. I think he's got a short, maybe a couple of months or so uh, residency to work on something, which is great. Right. Because people may not realise when a, there's so much happening in Angoulême. It's not just the festival once a year or the museum with all its um, adjacent buildings and things. But there's also throughout the year there's also a Maison des Auteurs, a house of authors, where all kinds of people can apply mm-hmm. for projects and get funding. I don't know exactly what they pay. They pay maybe partly towards accommodation and but basically it gives you a chance to get part financed and to work for a, a period of anything up to I think a couple of years in fact mm-hmm. in the case of Jessica Abel and Matt Madden on your own project in an amazing set that wonderful shared studio space really and then that was probably my favourite exhibition actually thinking about it in the end um, and it sh- is nearly always the my favourite one because the Maison des Auteurs shows works in progress from mm-hmm. there, the people there and there's, these are books that are not out yet things that are still brewing and they can come from all over the world there were people there from Korea and Mexico and all kinds of places and you think blimey these books are going to be amazing because mm-hmm. they're, they're working on them uh, and they're going to come and so that's always a good place to spot new new material coming up and I guess get that inspiration we were talking about, that yeah. enthusiasm and that recharge where you look yeah. at stuff that's coming and you go, wow, there's still great things ahead. Yeah. We don't have yeah. to just look back or look at this year. It's, mm-hmm. There's always a fresh mm-hmm. flow. Mm-hmm.